He had explained patiently to Ali that for years he had worked more than 10 hours a day. He had few enjoyments or hobbies and never went on holiday. Surely was it a crime to have a drink when he wanted one. But it is forbidden, the boy said. Pavel shrugged, I know. And so it's gambling, isn't it? Yes, but surely we're only human. Each time Pavel took a drink, the boy winced or made a fastidious face as an accompaniment. This made Pavel drink more quickly. The waiter, wanted to please his friend, brought another glass of whiskey. Pavel knew he was getting drunk, but he couldn't stop himself. Ali had a horrible look on his face, full of disgust and censure. It was as if he hated his father. Halfway through the meal, Pavel suddenly lost his temper, threw a plate on the door. He had felt like ripping the cloth from the table, but the waiters and other customers were staring at him. Yet he wouldn't stand for his own son, telling him the difference between right and wrong. He knew he wasn't a bad man. He had a conscience. There were a few things of which he was ashamed of, but on the whole he had lived a decent, decent life. When have I had time to be wicked? he asked Ali. In a low, monotonous voice, the boy explained that Pavès had not, in fact, lived a good life. He had broken countless rules of the Quran. For instance, Pavès demanded, Ali hadn't needed time to think, as if he had been waiting for this moment. He asked his father if he didn't relish pork pies. Well, Pavès couldn't deny that he loved crispy bacon, smothered with mushrooms and mustard and sandwiched between slices of fried bread. In fact, he ate this for breakfast every morning. Ali then reminded Pavès that he had ordered his own wife to cook pork sausages, saying to her, You're not in the village now, this is England, we have to fit in. Pavès was so annoyed and perplexed by this attack that he called for more drink. The problem is this, the boy said. He leaned across the table. For the first time that night, his eyes were, were alive. You are too implicated in Western civilization. Pavis burped. He thought he was going to choke. Implicated, he said. But we live here. The Western materialists hate us, Ali said. Papa, how can you love someone which hates you? What is the answer then? Pavis said miserably, according to you. Ali addressed his father fluently, as if Pavès were a rowdy crowd that had to be quelled and convinced. The law of Islam would rule the world. The skin of the infidel would burn off again and again. The Jews and Christians would be routed. The West was a sink of hypocrites, adulterers, homosexuals, drug, taters, drug takers and prostitutes. As Ali talked, Pavès looked out of the window as if to check, but they were still in London. My people have taken enough. If the persecution doesn't stop, there will be jihad. I and millions of others would gladly give our lives for the cause. But why? Why? Pavel said. For us, the reward would be in paradise. Paradise? Finally, as Pavel's eyes filled with tears, the boy urged him to mend his ways. How is that possible? Pavel asked. Pray, Ali said. Pray beside me. Pavès called for the bill and ushered his boy out of the restaurant as soon as he was able. He couldn't take any more. Ali sounded as if he'd swallowed someone else's voice. On the way home, the boy sat in the back of the taxi as if he were a customer. What has made you like this? Pavès asked him, afraid that somehow he was, he was to blame for all this. Is there a particular event which has influenced you? Living in this country. But I love England, Pavès said, watching his boy in the mirror. They let you do almost anything here. That is the problem, he replied. For the first time in years, Pavis couldn't see straight. He knocked the side of the car against the lorry, ripping off the, the wing mirror. They were luck lucky not to have been stopped by the police. Pavis would have lost his license and therefore his job. Getting out of the car at the house, Pavis stumbled and fell in the road, scraping his hands and ripping his trousers. He managed to haul himself up. The boy didn't even offer him his hand. Pavels told Bettina he was now willing to pray if that was what the boy wanted, if that would dislodge the pitiless look from his eyes. But what I object to, he said, is being told by my own son that I'm going to hell. What finished Pavels off was that the boy had said he was giving up on countenancy. When Pavels had asked why, Ali had said sarcastically that it was obvious. Western education cultivates an anti-religious attitude. 
and according to Ali, in the world of accountants, it was, an, it was usual to meet women, drink alcohol and practice usury. But it's well-paid work, Pavis argued. For years you've been preparing. Ali said he was going to begin to work in prisons with poor Muslims who were struggling to maintain their purity in the face of corruption. Finally, at the end of the evening, as Ali was going to bed, he had asked his father why he didn't have a beard, or at least a moustache. I feel, I feel as if I've lost my son, Pavez told Bettina. I can't bear to be looked at as if I'm a criminal. I've decided what to do. What is it? I'm going to tell him to pick up his prayer mat and get out of my house. It will be the hardest thing I've ever done, but tonight I'm going to do it. But you mustn't give up on him, said Bettina. Many young people fall into cults and superstitious groups. It doesn't mean they'll always feel the same way. She said Pavez had to stick by his boy, giving him support until he came through. Pavez was persuaded that she was right, even though he didn't feel like giving his son more love than he had, when he had hardly been thanked for all he had already given. Nevertheless, Pavez tried to endure his son's looks and reproaches. He attempted to make conversation about his beliefs, but if Pavez ventured any criticism, Ali always had a brusque reply. On one occasion, Ali accused Pavez of groveling to the whites. In contrast, he explained, he was not inferior. There was more to the world than the West, though the West always thought it was best. How is it you know that, Pavez said, seeing as you've never left England? Ali replied with a look of contempt. One night, having assured there was no alcohol in his bread, Pavez sat down at the kitchen table with Ali. He hoped Ali would compliment him on the beard he was growing, but Ali didn't appear to notice. The previous day, Pavez had been telling Bettina that he thought people in the West sometimes felt inwardly empty and that people needed a philosophy to live by. Yes, said Bettina, that's the answer. You must tell him what your philosophy of life is. Then he will understand that there are other beliefs. After some fatigue and consideration, Pavez was ready to begin. The boy watched him as if he expected nothing. Haltingly, Pavez said that people had to treat one another with respect, particularly children, their parents. This did seem for a moment to affect the boy. Hart and Pavez continued. In his view, this life was all there was, and when you died, you rotted in the earth. Grass and flowers will grow out of me, but something of me will live on. How? And other people? I will continue, in you. At this the boy appeared a little distressed. And your grandchildren, Pavez added for good measure. But while I am here on earth, I want to make the best of it. And I want you too, as well. What do you mean by make the best of it? asked the boy. Well, said Pavez, for a start, you should enjoy yourself. Yes, enjoy yourself, without hurting others. Ali said that enjoyment was a bottomless pit. But I don't mean enjoyment like that, said Pavez. I mean the beauty of living. All over the world our people are repressed, was the boy's reply. I know, Pavez replied, not, in shy, not entirely sure who our people were, but st still, life is for living. Ali said, real morality has existed for hundreds of years. Around the world, millions and millions of people share my beliefs. Are you saying you are right and they are all wrong? Ali looked at his father with such aggressive confidence that Pavez could say no more. One evening, Bettina was sitting in Pavez's car after visiting a client when they passed a boy on the street. That's my son, Pavez said suddenly. They were on the other side of town in a poor district where there were two mosques. Pavez set his face hard. Bettina turned to watch him. Slow down then, slow down, she said. He's good looking, reminds me of you, but with a more determined flavor face. Please, can't we stop? What for? I'd like to talk to him. Pavez turned the cab around and stopped beside the boy. Coming home? Pavez asked. It's quite a way. The sullen boy shrugged and got into the back seat. Bettina sat in the front. Pavez became aware of Bettina's short skirt, gaudy rings, and nice blue eyeshadow. He became conscious that the smell of her perfume, which he loved, filled the cab. He opened the window. While Pavez drove as best he could, Bettina said gently to Ali, Where have you been? The mosque, he said. And how are you getting on at college? Are you working hard? Who are you to ask me these questions? He said, looking out of the window. Then they hid bad traffic and the car came to a standstill. 
By now Bettina had inadvertently laid her hand on Pavese's shoulder. She said, Your father, who is a good man, is very worried about you. You know he loves you more than his own life. You say he loves me, the boy said. Yes, said Bettina. Then why is he letting a woman like you touch him like that? If Bettina looked at the boy in anger, he looked back at her with twice as much cold fury. She said, What kind of woman am I that deserves to be spoken to like that? You know, he said. Now let me out. Never, Pavese replied. Don't worry, I'm getting out, Bettina said. No, don't, said Pavese. But even as the car moved, she opened the door, threw herself out, and ran away across the road. Pavese shouted after her several times, but she had gone. Pavese took Ali back to the house, saying nothing more to him. Ali went straight to his room. Pavese was unable to read the paper, watch television, or even sit down. He kept pouring himself drinks. At last he went upstairs and paced up and down outside Ali's room. When finally he opened the door, Ali was praying. The boy didn't even glance his way. Pavese kicked him over. Then he dragged the boy up by his shirt and hit him. The boy fell back. Pavese hit him again. The boy's face was bloody. Pavese was panting. He knew that the boy was unreachable, but he struck him nonetheless. The boy neither covered himself nor retaliated. There was no fear in his eyes. He only said, through his split lip, So, who's the fanatic now? <laughs>